In my previous video, on why the original 1933 King Kong is so great, I mentioned that I don't care for the remakes of it. It's already a nearly perfect film, and you can't remake a perfect film and have it come out any better. The only way to go is making it worse in one way or another. But while I dislike remakes, I did say that I enjoy seeing what King Kong inspires. While I'm not a huge fan of the monster himself, uh, I do like seeing how different people take that monster, take those concepts, and reinterpret them in new stories. It's happened a few times in American media, and there was an animated series in the 2000s, and there's the MonsterVerse. Now, while that can be a video of its own, suffice it to say right now that I appreciated how Kong Skull Island was not just an attempt to remake the original. Who really took to King Kong was Japan. Japan doesn't seem to have met a giant monster it didn't like, and King Kong was the first. The original film was a smash hit around the world, and in the land of the rising sun, it inspired several bootleg versions. Wase Kingu Kongu, literally Japanese King Kong, was the first, rushed into production and released in 1933. This now lost film was itself a commentary on King Kong's popularity. In it, a stage actor performs a play based on the film, in order to earn the wealth that would allow him to marry the love of his life. Until he sees her with another guy and gives chase, while wearing the gorilla suit. Hilarity ensues. In 1934, there was an unofficial manga version, and then came the King Kong that appeared in Edo in 1938, in response to that year's re-release of the original film. This also lost film involved a gorilla running amok in the Edo period, though the jury is still out on whether or not the gorilla was giant. Tokusatsu is the Japanese word for a special effects film, but despite the poster art, this was likely simply a poverty row jidageki, the word for an historical drama. Based on stills that have survived, he doesn't seem to have been giant, and it is very likely that this film shows a migration of the concept of King Kong from a giant ape to just any gorilla. Osamu Tezuka, the god of manga, had a penchant for adapting classic films he grew up with into comics that fit into the world of unique characters he was developing. His version of Metropolis was made into a feature film in 2001, and among the stories he adapted into manga were Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost World and King Kong. The resemblance of either one to the original story is merely cosmetic, however. King Kong came back to Japan in 1952, not too long after Abbott and Costello parodied it and the adventure movie genre in 1949's Africa Screams. Kong's re-release was so successful that it proved to Toho Studios that giant monster movies could be commercially viable. That re-release, Hollywood's The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms in 1953, the ongoing trauma of the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the 1954 Lucky Dragon No. 5 disaster, in which a Japanese fishing vessel was caught in the fallout of the atomic tests at Bikini Atoll, all came together in the form of Gojira. Known, of course, as Godzilla in the West, Gojira is without a doubt one of the greatest Japanese films. It is a moody, somber, sublime meditation on the horrors of war and the threat of the atom. Where American atomic monster movies, like 20,000 Fathoms, come off as preachy and superficial, Gojira is achingly profound. It came from the only country to ever have atomic bombs dropped on it. Just like the smash hit of King Kong inspired a sequel rushed out in short order, so did Gojira. Godzilla Raids Again was released in 1955. It was a lighter film in tone, bringing in a second monster to represent the Cold War between global atomic superpowers, with Japan literally caught in the middle. And then there was nothing. For seven years, Godzilla lay dormant. Not that Toho didn't try with inventing other monsters. Half-Human, Rodan, the Mysterians, Varan, and Mothra were all released between 1955 and 1961, and while Mothra did reasonably well, none of them were the success of Gojira or King Kong before it. And I understand why. While they all have some interesting things going on, none of them are Gojira. 
Half Human is a human-scale story with a Japanese take on the trope of creepy hillbillies. Varan has some interesting religious angles, and the Mysterians invokes a world where the Atom has decimated an entire culture's genetics. The uh, titular alien Mysterians are here for Earth women. Mothra is actually my favorite of the bunch. She's almost the opposite of Kong, in that I don't particularly care for any specific Mothra movie, but I love Mothra as a kaiju. I'd even say that she is my favorite kaiju. Unlike an atomic abomination, born of human violence against each other and nature, Mothra is a kami, a goddess of life, death, and rebirth. She is the personification of the forces of nature, and her power lies in the power of nature's cycle. Still, none of these films have the raw power and poignancy of Gojira. So 1962 rolls around, and Toho is interested in resurrecting Godzilla and their flagging kaiju films. But remember that at this time, Godzilla had been out of the game for a while, and, well, he wasn't exactly a heroic figure. Therefore, Godzilla needed a little bit of help. And that help came with a real headliner. The true King of the Monsters, King Kong. It's bizarre to think of this now, in 2022, when Godzilla is so huge that we can have multiple different versions of Godzilla running simultaneously. Godzilla is the big deal, even bigger than Kong. But in 1962, Godzilla was a semi-obscure villain. This fact also clouds how we interpret the ending. Partisan Godzilla fanboys today will argue that the ending is ambiguous, and clearly a tie, that Godzilla actually won because Kong swam away, and all sorts of excuses. But all those excuses ignore how the film is actually structured, as an actual movie, and they ignore Godzilla's small place in Japan's culture at that time. Godzilla is the villain. He's the bad guy. Kong, on the other hand... Well, I mentioned Abbott and Costello's Africa Screams already, a parody of King Kong released over a decade and a half after the original film. Kong was the one getting cartoons and parodies and references consistently since his debut. King Kong was better known. King Kong was more popular. King Kong got top billing. Godzilla wouldn't even get that until several movies down the line. Mothra even got top billing over Godzilla. Typically, villains don't win the movie. The good guy, and the more popular and well-known monster, King Kong, goes toppling with Godzilla into the ocean. The good guy and more popular and well-known monster surfaces. The humans even wonder if Godzilla survived. The only ambiguity is a slight cliffhanger on whether the villainous threat of Godzilla might return someday. And to drive the point further home, Toho's own film catalog of 1962-63 states in its synopsis, a spectacular duel is arranged on the summit of Mount Fuji, and King Kong is victorious, quote-unquote. Godzilla fans will try to cite producer Tomoyuki Tanaka's statements that he thought it was a draw. Statements he made in the 1980s, decades later. Even the myth of Godzilla winning the Japanese version of the film was made up by Americans in the pages of famous monsters of Filmland, for whom Godzilla was emerging as the newer, hipper, and cooler monster. Okay. Got, got that out of my system. King Kong vs. Godzilla is the true emergence of the Godzilla Monster Brawl format. Godzilla Raids Again was essentially a one-off sequel. This film is where it really begins, in big, splashy tohoscope and technicolor, where thin plots act to hang monster brawls on. Nevertheless, King Kong vs. Godzilla has some interesting things going on. Some stories during Toho's films of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, called the Showa era, are very A-plot, B-plot. My favorite is Dogura, in which the B-plot of Jewel Thieves has virtually nothing whatsoever to do with the apocalyptic crisis of a jellyfish from space threatening to sterilize the Earth of life. King Kong vs. Godzilla actually manages to hew its human-centered plot closely on the monsters. Godzilla happens to have risen from his icy tomb, but it's the humans who brought Kong to Japan. King Kong vs. Godzilla is very different tonally from Gojira. The studio, perhaps realizing the implicit absurdity of what they had, decided to play it up primarily as a comedy. Comedic actor Ichiro Hiroshima, nicknamed the Japanese Chaplain, heads a cast of Toho Studio regulars in a biting satire of consumerism and media in post-war Japan. 
Two monsters are brawling across Japan, thanks to the malfeasance of a pharmaceutical company, and all its CEO can think about is ratings. Symbolically, these monsters unleashed by consumerism and the media destroy Atami Castle, representative of historic Japanese culture. Or not. Atami Castle was actually built as a tourist attraction in 1959. Is this even a commentary on the repackaged artifice that post-war consumerism has made of Japanese culture itself? Or did they just destroy the castle because it would look cool? During that brawl, Kong exhibits some strange new powers. The concept for King Kong vs. Godzilla began with Willis O'Brien trying to shop a concept for King Kong vs. Frankenstein around Hollywood. In his version, a new Kong would face a Frankenstein monster made from the parts of elephants, hippos, and other African wildlife. Unfortunately, O'Brien trusted producer John Beck, who shopped it to Toho in exchange for international distribution rights, without O'Brien or Kong's creator Marion C. Cooper knowing. The result is that Godzilla was recast in Kong's role, and Kong was recast in the Frankenstein monster's role, resulting in Kong gaining powers of electricity. But this wouldn't be the last time a Toho King Kong movie involved recasting the monsters. While the film was a smashing success, at over 12.5 million domestic ticket sales, it remains the most successful Godzilla movie of all time, even higher than the original Gojira's 9.6 million tickets. So naturally, a sequel to King Kong vs. Godzilla was immediately written up, which established right off the bat that Kong killed Godzilla. Godzilla's corpse was discovered and brought back to Japan. The script then had the government deliberately bring Godzilla back to life to fight a rampaging Kong. The sequel was, however, scuttled, due in no small part to the copyright brouhaha that resulted from King Kong vs. Godzilla. Willis O'Brien was, of course, incensed at Beck for basically stealing his idea. Now, while Toho arranged with Beck for the concept, they licensed Kong from RKO Pictures, makers of the original film. But Cooper, the man who created Kong, asserted in court that RKO never owned Kong to begin with. Kong was licensed to RKO by Cooper. Kong's copyright status is still a huge mess we're dealing with to this day. Suffice it to say that Toho wanted to shy away from that whole mess. While they were deemed by the courts to be an innocent bystander in the whole thing, they were still keen to make more profitable Kong movies. And this is where Rankin-Bass comes in. You may be most familiar with Rankin-Bass's classic holiday specials, like Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and Year Without a Santa Claus. But they had hands in traditional animation as well, and debuted The King Kong Show in 1966. The King Kong Show was notable for how it reworked Kong into not only an heroic figure, but a friendly one. Instead of Carl Denham and his film crew, it is the Bond family of researchers who come to Mondo Island to study and befriend Kong. From there, adventures ensue involving monsters, mad scientists, and evil developers who would denude the island of its resources. Notably in the history of animation, The King Kong Show was the first American-produced series whose animation work was outsourced to Japan. Toei Studios picked up the chores, and the series ended up being just as popular in Japan, if not more so. There's a whole fascinating genre of Japanese magazine art based on the cartoon, depicting Kong in hyper-realistic style. The cartoon has charm, fun characters, and a neat mid-century art style in both the actual cartoon and the Japanese magazine art. The pilot episode retells the original movie, but with a happier ending. It's an interesting parallel reality where people made friends with Kong, just like every kid flipping through famous monsters wanted to. Bypassing the legal mess around RKO, Toho arranged with Rankin-Bass to make feature films based on the cartoon. The first of these was the film that became Ebira Horror of the Deep in 1966. Originally conceived as Operation Robinson Crusoe King Kong vs. Ebira, Kong would be dropped and replaced with Godzilla when Toho and Rankin-Bass couldn't come to an agreement on who should direct the film and the special effects. The result was a suspiciously Kong-like Godzilla, including him being resurrected by electricity and taking an inordinate interest in nubile young ladies, as well as the film taking place on a tropical island instead of trashing Japan. Ebira is considered a kind of Kong movie in spirit, if not in fact. Thankfully, the two studios worked out their differences, and 1967 saw the release of King Kong Escapes. 
This film ended up as a much more straightforward adaptation of the cartoon than Evera did, albeit still a fairly loose one. The Bond family are replaced by steel-jawed actor Rhodes Reason, Godzilla regular Akira Takarada, and American expat model Linda Miller. Gorosaurus was invented to replace the T-Rex, and he would go on to star in Destroy All Monsters the next year. McKenna Kong and his creator, the mad scientist Doctor Who, were taken from the cartoon, though this Doctor Who is quite a bit different from the cartoon version. But Kong still does Kong things, like the climax where he and McKenna Kong duke it out atop Tokyo Tower, Linda Miller in hand. I'll also say that I much prefer the Kong costume in this film to the very strange and creepy one in King Kong vs. Godzilla. I'm not sure what they were smoking when they designed that, but it looks like they got it out of their system to make a much more Kong-esque version for King Kong Escapes. I also love the design of Mechanicong. This robotic double predated Mechagodzilla, and I love his sleek mid-century lines. He's actually kind of kind of cute. King Kong Escapes is controversial among Kong fans, though, because it is so divergent from the Kong we know from American cinema. And I fully grant that its charms might escape people who aren't as versed in the tropes and aesthetics of Toho, Showa-era tokusatsu films, or the Rankin-Bass cartoon. King Kong Escapes is a kind of perfect distillation of Showa-era Godzilla movie themes, just without the Godzilla. It has monster brawls, retrofuturism, comedy and spectacle, robotic doppelgangers, and a general tone that is both mid-century hip and, frankly, a bit nutty. It's not a movie you can take very seriously, and that's fine. It's everything that one of these types of movies can be, and I personally think it ranks up there with Destroy All Monsters and Invasion of the Astro Monster as my favorites of the type. But the only thing King Kong Escapes is missing is alien invaders trying to mind control the monsters in their plot to conquer Earth. In this film, that role falls to Doctor Who. Suffice it to say that King Kong Escapes has grown on me to become my second favorite Kong movie after the original. You have probably been able to pick up that I like Japanese film, culture, anime, and manga, and monster movies specifically. And while King Kong Escapes is very different from the original King Kong, I think it is less different from it than, say, King Kong vs. Godzilla or Destroy All Monsters is from the original Gojira. Both King Kong and King Kong Escapes are nearly perfect films in their genres. The former is the pinnacle of 1930s golden age of Hollywood adventure films. The latter captures all the colorful, insane fun of a 1960s Japanese tokusatsu movie. I think it shows the durability of Kong, that he doesn't have to die with the 1933 film, so to speak. New and interesting things can be done with him in different formats, different genres, and even different countries. Well, after that, the 1976 Hollywood remake came and went, and Toho attempted to film a 30th anniversary rematch between the two titans in the 1990s. Unfortunately, hefty licensing fees from Turner Entertainment and ongoing legal troubles prevented a round two. Then they tried it with Godzilla vs. Mechanicong, but that was too close to Kong, so they defaulted to Godzilla going more rounds with Ghidorah and Mothra. But what were those legal troubles? Well, you see, a hundred-year-old playing card company and toy manufacturer named Nintendo had just gotten into the burgeoning field of electronic games. They managed a few successes with handheld LCD games, but really launched into the market in 1981 with a hugely popular arcade game called Donkey Kong. This clear homage to King Kong put Universal Studios on edge, who had just been in legal disputes with Dino De Laurentiis over the 1976 version. The whole thing is a mess. But Nintendo was exonerated on the grounds that Donkey Kong was clearly not intended to be King Kong, but merely an homage, and that Universal didn't even own King Kong. In fact, Universal themselves argued in the case with De Laurentiis that nobody owned Kong. He was public domain. N not all of him. The courts eventually parceled out who owns what about Kong, and after that, Japan has been selective about how they handle Kong. I mean, for one, they now have Godzilla as a monster of the very own. Not imported from America, but a homegrown monster who has achieved a worldwide popularity that has eclipsed Kong himself. They're justifiably proud of Godzilla. And secondly, they have their own Kong. Donkey Kong is the ultimate legacy of King Kong in Japan. 
who has spun off into his own iconic status as a companion of Mario and company. But that said, Japan still has a soft spot for the big guy. They regularly produce merchandise, from arcade claw machine plushies to blind box figures to high-end soft vinyls and collectibles, more often indeed than the United States does. After all, Japan hasn't really met a giant monster they don't like, and King Kong was the first.